So to all of you for being here, I'm excited to see such a large group that wants to hear about this strange concatenation of ideas of sympathy and economics. Uh, of course, this is a topic on which uh, Dean Peart has written extensively, as well as David Levy, her co-author, and not coincidentally one of my advisors. Um, so in a way, I think that my uh, talk here is going to be complementary to some of the work that they've done, and I certainly owe a big intellectual debt to them both. Uh, also, I'm very grateful to the Marshall Center for making this forum possible, um, as well as for allowing me to be in residence here for the year. Uh, and in particular, it's great to get to address a group uh, such as those of us here today, a mix of faculty, and it looks like some undergraduates from different disciplines. I really think that I'll benefit from your questions and comments uh, later, in the, later in the session. I know that some of the faculty here and maybe some of the students have classes at 1.30, so my plan is to talk for maybe 35 to 40 minutes and then allow perhaps 20 minutes for <coughs> questions. Uh, but if you need to walk out to get to your obligations, you know, I won't be hurt. So probably the most logical first question to begin with here is why should we even care about sympathy in the first place? Um, seems like a strange topic, doesn't seem very related to economics. Uh, to sort of motivate um, the talk, I want to show a great clip from a movie you'll all recognize, and I'm sure you all love, uh, from the 1980s. Let's see if we can get this to work. So a classic statement of what maybe the stereotypical view of economics uh, is about, sometimes to outsiders. It seems sometimes as if economics comes across this way. Since Adam Smith, there has been a, a tradition that tries to reconcile the individual pursuit of self the common good or good outcomes for the whole, going all the way up to, to Ken Arrow and other modern uh, thinkers. But as many people have pointed out, there are problems with this view, uh, this view of sort of narrow, self-seeking, um, uh, hedonistic gratification on the part of individuals. As Kenneth Boulding pointed out in 1969, it seems to leave out other people. It also leaves out the possibility of heroism, of action without counting the cost, the actions of soldiers or parents or statesmen who are trying to uh, maybe sacrifice their own careers for the good of the country or of some common whole. Amartya Sen uh, has made a similar point and has also pointed out that the efficient outcomes theorized by, by economists sometimes might not be morally appealing, that it might leave uh, less resource people without sufficient um, funds to live a full life, uh, but that you couldn't make those people better off without hurting the wealthier people, and that, that would be blocked by notions of um, Pareto superior efficiency. Here at uh, the Jepson School over the summer, uh, Professor Buchanan from George Mason University made a related point uh, just down the hall here. He said that in the lead up to the financial crisis, many economists made a mistake. They believed that the theorems about the good effects of self-interest in the production of private goods, of partitionable goods, um, don't necessarily lead to the production of good rules for the polity or the industry as a whole. And so economists' fixation on self-interest blinded them to the, uh, the interactive effects that could lead to problems like the financial crisis that we've just experienced. That the pursuit on the part of bankers and government officials of their narrow self-interest ended up leading to a catastrophe for the overall system. And the connection, obviously, to a leadership school like this is how uh, we conceive the social good that we think of ourselves perhaps as promoting and also how we think about our own motivations to the extent that we're trying to draw inspiration from economics for any of this. Now, economists might respond that, in fact, they don't promote selfishness. The discipline of economics doesn't promote greed. Uh, there's a famous quote from John Stuart Mill where he said that if you are not selfish or hard-hearted already, political economy will not make you so. 
But actually, some recent research by Robert Frank and others has indicated that there is a feedback effect between economics and being selfish, that students who've taken undergraduate uh, econ courses actually defect more often in various collective goods games or prisoners' dilemmas, that somehow they've changed their own preferences through the study of economics. So it's important that we maybe conceptualize these issues correctly. The economists might still, though, have a second line of defense. And they would say that the self-interest we advocate is not narrow, it's not selfish. In fact, it can encompass and include a great number of other interests. It can encompass your family, your friends, even your community. And so as Philip Wicksteed pointed out almost 100 years ago, it's possible that in a market transaction, uh, when we go in to negotiate, we're thinking of everyone else except the one person that we're engaging in a transaction with. So they're the only person that we have a non-tuistic view towards. Everyone else we have an altruistic view towards. So that's the entry point for why sympathy might, might matter, because sympathy is the name that I want to use to talk about that concern for others, potentially an escape route for economics from this fixation on selfishness. What I want to call the puzzle of modern sympathy, though, is that there seems to be a tension or a clash between the way uh, we theorize sympathy in the 21st, the late 20th century, uh, and the way it worked back in the 18th and 19th centuries. So here we have two, two great thinkers, two inspirational people, Amartya Sen and Deirdre McCloskey. Deirdre also was here during the Summer Institute back in June. And both of these thinkers have criticized the type of sympathy that is embodied in a utility function like this. This is just a very simple kind of general form. Here you have Mr. H on the left, and Mr. H's utility is driven by the commodities or goods, services, et cetera, both that he consumes and that a person or persons that he's sympathetic with consumes. So if Jonathan and I are friends, my utility is going to be partly driven by the sandwich I'm going to have and by the one that he consumes. So I don't want to leave him out in the cold. But as Sin and McCloskey have pointed out, this view of sympathy uh, is in a way sort of egoistic. Um, it means that my pursuit of my own happiness sort of involves someone else. And in some strange sense, I'm just pleasing myself when I serve others. It seems to preclude the possibility of genuine sacrifice. It has an air of almost definitional egoism when a Dietrich Bonhoeffer and an Eichmann are both acting according to the same motives. They're just doing what makes them feel good. Bonhoeffer just happens to be motivated by an idea of nobility or ethics that Eichmann lacks. However, um, both Sin and McCloskey, even though they criticize this idea of, of sympathy as being just sort of a form of prudence, also praise the blessed Adam Smith and his great book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And they praise it specifically because it allows for the possibility of committed, um, committed conduct, conduct motivated by ethical concerns, potentially sacrificial ethical concerns. The puzzle is that sympathy is the master idea of the theory of moral sentiments. It's a theory of ethics based on sympathy. So it's strange that the modern idea should fail to generate concern for norms and ethics, whereas the old idea, the 18th century idea, did. So I want to try to answer this puzzle by distinguishing between different forms of sympathy. These are forms that correspond somewhat to what you can find in the Oxford English Dictionary. But basically, my warrant for them is just going to be my explanation, sort of the introspective plausibility of it. So you, the audience, can decide whether you think these different forms make sense or not. In particular, I perceive that there are four forms of sympathy that might be relevant for economics. Responsive, social, welfare, and concord sympathy. And I'm going to explain each of these in turn. And here we have, between them, these two men, Hutchison and Smith, explained all of them. So you'll, you'll see some quotes from these gentlemen as we, as we go forward. The first kind of sympathy uh, Hutchison explained as the fellow feeling by which we are disposed to mirth when we see that others are cheerful and to weep with those who weep without any consideration of our own interest. 
And we've all had this experience where we go into a room where some great tragedy has occurred, uh, and even if we were happy beforehand, we feel ourselves a little bit cast down as a result. Or if we hear someone laugh, we tend to laugh, or if someone is happy, we tend to be happy. There's almost a contagious effect of this form of sympathy. So just kind of as a demonstration, and maybe to break up uh, the talk a little bit, this is a short clip from one of my favorite movies, Much Ado About Nothing. I just want you to observe the effects on yourself that this scene has. So if you haven't seen the movie, this is a scene where Beatrice and Benedict, who are two famous wits, engage in a quick bit of Shakespearean repartee while they're being observed uh, by some of their friends. Okay, so when we, it, when we started to watch this film clip, everyone was in their very serious academic mode. But as it went on, and the Shakespearean repartee continued, I heard a few laughs from the audience, and it became a little bit infectious. And so I sort of glanced around, and I could see that some of you were beginning to smile in sympathy, in responsive sympathy to the clip. But then at the end, when Beatrice has her moment of anger, it sort of damped things, didn't it? I mean, that's certainly what I always feel when I watch this, that you, that you feel a little bit of sadness or resentment. You get, you get a little bit changed as a result. So that's an example of what responsive sympathy does. Not only our reaction to this film, but our reaction to each other in the room. There's a little bit of contagion going on. Now, there's a close connection between this kind of sympathy and what I'm calling social sympathy, the sympathy of joint or shared experience. The picture here is from uh, another one of my favorite movies, the Patrick O'Brien film, Master and Commander. These are a bunch of Royal Navy officers celebrating in their wardroom or wherever you eat on a ship in the middle of the ocean. So we've all had experiences like this, where um, the food and drink that we're consuming is actually secondary to the pleasure that we're having in consuming it together with other people who we like, or who we're at least on good terms with. That's why there's songs about drinking alone that are kind of sad, it's not just about what you're consuming, it's about the fact that you're consuming it with other people. And the difference between this and responsive sympathy is there's a focus on a shared experience rather than just a shared emotion, just a shared glance or expression of the face, and there's also proximity or interaction. You don't get the same effect of dining together if you're looking through a Skype connection with your friend a thousand miles away. There's something about the full sensory uh, interaction that makes things more pleasant. Next is a form of sympathy that I think is reflective of, of the modern view. I'm calling this welfare sympathy. And here again is Hutchison's description. Scarce any man can think himself sufficiently happy, though he has the full supplies of all things requisite for his own use or pleasure. He must also have some tolerable stores for such as are dear to him, since their misery or distress will necessarily disturb his own happiness. And then here in the bottom right-hand corner is an attempt by Francis Edgeworth in the 19th century to put some numbers on that. And Edgeworth thought that an agent might sometimes maximize not P, where P is his own consumption of utility, but P plus lambda pi uh, that represents the utility of someone else. So you can see here there's kind of this egoistic tinge of the idea because the the person, and it, and it is a man in Hutchison's thinking, it's the father, it's the head of the household, he's thinking of 
his own happiness sort of indirectly uh, affected or reflected through his family members. That's not to say that welfare sympathy is always a bad thing. We've all seen advertisements like help the hungry, uh, help people overseas who you know, have suffered from some disaster, and it touches our heart, and we say that our heart goes out to them. We have extended ourself, we've extended our own utility function to include these other people. And that leads to the other characteristic of welfare sympathy, which is the sharing of resources. Instead of just hoarding everything for ourselves or our own family, we're willing to extend our budget, to extend our resources and monies out to uh, purchase things for other people, to assist them. This picture, by the way, is from Haiti. Um, and there's, there's a quote going with it from a mother who says, when the kids are hungry and have nothing to feed them, they cry every day from hunger. When my children cry, it breaks my heart. And I think all of us who have children or relatives have experienced that feeling too, that their pain affects us as well. I think though that the form of sympathy that is maybe least discussed and that I'm really focusing on in this, in this paper is what I call concord sympathy. I should stress that none of these words are used by any of the authors I'm talking about. This is just me perceiving different senses in their, in their writings. Smith says that there's a pleasure of mutual sympathy and that this is the grounding for our desire to act in an ethical way. That when we, when we sympathize with someone else's passion or their action, that's the same thing for Smith as saying that we approve of it. So in the picture here, uh, we have uh, a, fire, um, a fireman trying to rescue a family, and there's a woman lowering a child to him. Smith would say that to evaluate the emotions of the people in this picture, we engage in a process of imaginative projection. That we think about what we would feel in their place, and we compare that projection with what those people actually feel. And as a result, we feel either the pleasure of approving of their emotion or the displeasure of disapproving of it. So in this case, at least from what we can see of their facial expressions, the mother is perhaps a little concerned to be lowering her child down, the child's afraid, but given the situation, given what we think we would do in that circumstance, we approve of their action and of their feelings. And so we have this feeling of mutual sympathy. Now, this differ differs from the other conceptions of sympathy because we don't have to fully adopt another person's emotional state or feel a deep concern for their own welfare. Smith says that if we're walking down a street and we see someone uh, who has a very sad expression and we learn that their father has just died, we approve of their grief even though we really don't know the person. We really don't feel our heart going out to them the same way as if it was our friend or a family member who was in the same circumstance. But we know, based on our experience, that if we did have a close connection, that we would feel that kind of sympathy. And so we sort of grant this conditional concord sympathy to people. It doesn't imply that we want to transfer resources to them. Concord sympathy also, also is closely entwined with imagination because of this importance of imaginative projection. It's not just Smith who, who thinks this. <coughs> David Hume also, in a slightly different form, makes a similar point that one of the reasons we act ethically is because we're trying to act in a way that other people who approach and regard us can approve of and sympathize with. No one can go around saying, I act on the principle that only my narrow self-interest matters. I go into Terry's office and says, Terry, you should just know that I am a complete egoist. If I can steal something of yours and not be detected, by God, I'm going to do it. You know, if I, I'm just going to take you know, everything I can. You wouldn't trust me, and more so, you wouldn't approve of me at all. You would look upon me with scorn and disdain. And so it's important for me to get the approval of Terry and Rebecca and everyone that I meet that I conduct my conduct according to a general rule that everyone can approve of. And that requires imagination. I want to contend that there's a particular connection between concord sympathy and ethical rules that's lacking in the other forms of sympathy. For Hume, uh, justice is founded on utility, but the reason we care about utility is connected to sympathy, both because we care about the good of others from the perspective of a collective whole, and like I just said, because we want the approval of others in our 
actions. We have this love of fame Hume calls the force of many sympathies. And then likewise for Smith, sympathizing is approving. And what we want is not only the approval of other actual people, but the approval of the best informed and impartial person that we can think of, which of course for Smith famously is the impartial spectator. And the impartial spectator is connected in Smith's idea with an idea of praiseworthiness, not just actual praise. Smith says that we want not only to be loved, but to be lovely. Not only to be praised, worthy. The person of character, he says, is not content to receive approbation for something that he hasn't earned. He would feel bad about that. It would be like, you're getting a good grade on a paper that you had plagiarized. Instead, you want to know in your heart that you actually deserve the approbation that you receive. And for Smith, that approbation, that praiseworthiness, is connected with the impartial spectator. So to see the linkage between this and ethical rules, we're going to watch the last video. This is just a very short clip. Very famous or, or infamous uh, situation from the summer. This is during the British riots. It's what happens to a Malaysian exchange student who's been injured in the riots, and he's approached uh, by, some, uh, by some people on the street. So this incident attracted a lot of attention and outrage at the time, and I think it's a nice test of a Smithian process of ethical evaluation. So if we were to use this process of imaginative projection, we would look at the Malaysian student, we would enter into his situation, we would imagine what it would be like if we ourselves were injured by the side of the road, we feel someone helping us up, at first there's a kind of gratitude there. Then we learn that they've actually taken advantage of our weakness to betray us and, and steal from us. And so in our imaginative projection, we feel a resentment and anger at what's been done to us. So if, if the student had been in some position to retaliate, if he could have called the police or even you know, maybe turned around and, and, and socked the guy, we would probably feel sympathy with his action. We would approve of it. We would feel that it had propriety. But likewise, when we project ourselves into the situation of the thieves, we, we don't feel that we can sympathize with them. We don't want to steal from the Malaysian student. And so we have a disapprobation. We feel that their, act, their actions have impropriety. The other interesting thing about this video is it literally embodies spectating. The people who are taking it are on top of a building or inside an apartment. So they're removed from the situation. They're not... Um, consumed by greed or whatever, the, whatever motive it is for these thugs to rob the Malaysian student. They are a relatively disinterested spectator. We ourselves, who are watching this months later, who don't know any of the people who aren't there, we are still more disinterested. But by the same process, we can imagine the perfectly disinterested spectator, the person who is well informed about all the relevant facts uh, and who has no skin in the game at all, and that's the impartial spectator who Smith says evaluates all our actions and who we can in some, situa in some ways approximate the judgment for. And it's the desire for his approval that ultimately generates the rules of morality. So let me move on. Our, our own dean here has written about the importance of sympathy in motivating liberal reform in the 19th century. Drawing on Smith's tradition, uh, she and uh, Professor Levy have argued 
that there is a concept of sympathetic exchange that can allow economic actors to do something for another group, even if that's not going to be a Pareto-improving reform in some financial sense. And the paradigmatic case of this, uh, she and Professor Levy argue, is of the emancipation of the West Indian slaves in the 1830s. That uh, these, this was uh, the people that were cultivating the sugar islands in the Caribbean. There was terrible treatment, high mortality rates, and the British public was slowly awakened to this problem through a campaign of um, really propaganda, but propaganda in a good sense that you can uh, see acted out in the movie Amazing Grace, among other things. And eventually, the British decided not only to stop the slave trade, imp importation of new slaves, but to actually emancipate the slaves that were there in the West Indies. This was very expensive because they decided to actually compensate the owners of the slaves. It wasn't just the slaves were free tomorrow and the owners had to go stuff it. They got uh, some payment supposed to correspond to the market value of the enslaved people. So the idea of sympathetic exchange, which is a very powerful one, is that you would never do this if your only motivation was financial or even Pareto efficient. Because the slaves, after they were freed, surprisingly didn't want to work the 12 and 14 hour days under brutal conditions that they did before. They wanted to work, you know, five or six hours to cultivate their land, to grow enough food to eat, but then they were going to enjoy leisure. They were going to enjoy the beautiful climate in which they lived. And for some people, like Carlisle, this was outrageous. Look, they're not contributing to gross national product as much as they, knew, as they were before. Why do we ever let them free? The idea of sympathetic exchange blocks those sorts of concerns because the observer, the British taxpayer who uh, had to give some of their own money to emancipate people, can feel the satisfaction of knowing that they're now better off, that they're no longer enslaved. John Stuart Mill's writings um, were very central to this. He was one of the major opponents of slavery, and he really took Carlisle down in the great dispute they had in the British newspapers. And so what I want to claim is that Mill had an idea of concord sympathy that was helping to motivate his actions. This is from utilitarianism. He's talking about the origin of justice. And he says that there's two components of it, a desire to repel a hurt or damage to oneself and to those with whom one sympathizes, and then, then this is a broadened idea. There's, a, there's an idea of enlarged self-interest and enlarged sympathy that makes us want to have a common cause with the whole human race. Although he never uses sympathy, uh, he never qualifies it explicitly as a different sense, I think that enlarged sympathy in his usage corresponds to concord sympathy. Because he'll, he'll say things like, we want to have our goals be compatible with everyone else's. Uh, and that enlarged sympathy makes us retaliate or defend against threatened injuries or hurts to others. It seems to be associated not with sentiment or compassion, but with a sense of justice. And he explicitly said that the liberation of the slaves was not an affair of sentiment the anti-slavery leaders seldom spoke much of benevolence of philanthropy, but often of duty, crime, and sin. So I think there's an echo of Smith's Concord sympathy coming through Mill and the other reformers. Now I'm, I'm losing, I'm running out of time, so I want to move a little bit more swiftly. Opposed to this inheritance of Concord sympathy from Adam Smith, there was a related but distinct tradition that grew up that was more along the lines of welfare sympathy. And I just want to highlight three, three thinkers here. First, Jeremy Bentham, who's, uh, whose idea of sympathy is very clearly an extended self. He says, uh, there, people have, uh, there are persons in whose welfare an agent takes a concern, so their happiness is productive of pleasure to him, and their unhappiness productive of pain. And of course, this uh, idea was taken up by Edgeworth later in the 19th century, we've already seen. So he's going to model this in uh, mathematical terms, and in particular, he's modeling it in additive terms. So the utility of an agent is his own plus that of someone else. And this way of thinking reaches its highest, highest form, or at least a paradigmatic form in the modern, modern period with Gary Becker's work. This is from his theory of social interactions, where he's saying that in a family, the head of the family, the person with the most income, is going to transfer resources to his children, to his spouse, et cetera, 
until the marginal utility um, from his sympathetic utility function is equal for his own, an additional unit of his own consumption or an additional unit of consumption for his family members. So this is all in the same logical tradition, even though the symbolic representation of it differs. So the final claim that I want to make is that this welfare sympathy, although it's extremely powerful and it's a great way of thinking about the family in some ways, has lost an important element that Smith and others had in the Concord sympathy idea, and particularly this idea of fidelity to ethical rules. Smith had something that I call the stoical maxim. Um, there's, a, there's a collection of statements all very close together in the theory, theory of moral sentiments that I'm rolling together under that phrase. And what he basically is saying here is that an honest person, an ethical person, will refuse to steal or aggress against someone else, even if the advantage to them of doing that is going to be much more than the loss to the other person. So if I'm really thirsty right now and this tea looks great, and you're not. But I have flu, so you're well, you're a bad right. choice. You look, hale and, you look hale and healthy. So, you know, really, in utility terms, I would probably benefit a lot more from taking the tea from Professor White. You know, he's, he's just comfortable. He's had something to drink already. But Smith would say, no, Chris, you ought not to do it because it's still an aggression. I would still be think, taking something <laughs> of his, and that would affect my self-image. The impartial spectator would disapprove of it. I would have cheated, I would have aggressed, so therefore I'm not going to do it. And in fact, Smith goes kind of hyperbolic on this. He says, for one man to deprive another unjustly of anything or unjustly to promote his own advantage by the loss or disadvantage of another is more contrary to nature than death, than poverty, than pain, than all the misfortunes that can affect him. So I'd better not take Professor White's tea. So I decided to try to uh, actually test the stoical maxim within the conceptual framework of welfare economics. Now, you guys may know I am a George Mason economist, so that means that it really strains us to write delta or something to do, you know, a level of mathematics, but I was, I was, able, to, I was able to do this. Um, and what I found was just an implication, really, of welfare sympathy is that the levels of welfare sympathy needed to enact Smith's stoical maxim needed to prevent me from stealing something from someone else based solely on my concern for their welfare, on an extended self between me and Professor White, logically implies that I ought to transfer income to them as well. And that, that was just doing a constrained, you know, a constrained optimization problem with um, income parameters. And so let me just show you the, the graph that resulted. What this is saying is, along the x-axis here, are coefficients of sympathy. And in particular, in this additive case, a two, a coefficient of sympathy of two, is exactly enough to stop me from stealing something that would be twice as advantageous to me as it is to someone else. For welfare sympathy to stop me from doing that, at least under this simple additive way of thinking, uh, I have to have a coefficient of sympathy of two. But then when I do this constrained optimization problem, I find that, that implies that I ought to be transferring income to him, at least if we have equal income. But even if I'm much poorer than Professor White, in some situations, I ought to be giving him a little bit of money as well, which is a very bizarre conclusion, particularly because if Professor White feels the same way about me, we might be engaged in mutual transfers of income, kind of an arms race. You know, we're never actually able to, to instantiate this. I think this is implausible, uh, and I don't think that um, many people do this. And so the conclusion I draw is that additive welfare sympathy itself can't be the motivator for people to obey the stoical maxim, to the extent that they do. I know that people do actually cheat, they do actually steal, but I think we've all felt, and we do observe, that people will refuse to do advantageous things to themselves that transgress moral understanding, even if the chance of their being caught is negligible. And the example, it seems trivial, but the example I give in the paper is of um, umbrellas that are left in the lobbies of restaurants. So if you've ever been there and it's raining, there's like 100 umbrellas there, or in the, the D hall when it, when it rains. No one would know if you took that really nice umbrella. And even if they found you, you could say, oh, it was just a mistake. And yet people don't do it. They don't become what David Hume called a sensible knave. 
And the reason for that, I think, is not that they have a welfare sympathy for the owner of the umbrella, but because they have some other kind of ethical um, maxim, whether it comes from Concord sympathy or another source. The same effect holds, um, although a little more weakly, in the case of what I'm calling a multiplicative sympathy function. Let me just go back two slides. This is a little more sophisticated. Gary Becker uses it uh, in his papers in the 70s. He, uh, for him, it's a Cobb Douglas. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Obviously, there's more of an interdependence built into a function like this because the sympathies are actually, or the utilities are actually multiplied. But even so, if you kind of work into this and, and make some assumptions, it does appear to be the case that if you're very sympathetic to someone else, which in this graph corresponds to a lower number, then you will still transfer income to that person. So the same tension arises. Now, one response that, that Becker or another welfare sympathy thinker could make to all this is to say that, well, you, you only feel sympathy when uh, an ethical challenge is involved. The coefficient of sympathy sort of winks into existence when it's needed and winks out of existence a moment later. And that's a consistent position. I just don't find it very satisfying. Because then you have to figure out the model of what's driving the coefficient of sympathy. Why is it that I happen to feel a high coefficient of sympathy for Professor White only when I'm about to steal something from him, but then a moment later I don't? It seems to violate the assumption of stable preferences. So I don't find that a completely compelling objection. Well, I know that classes are coming, and I want to leave time for some questions and discussion. So let me just end with these two sort of maybe provocative images or cases. Uh, on the left-hand side is a painting of the Good Samaritan. So a man is coming down uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's assaulted by thieves, and the priest and the Levite pass him by for various reasons, including ritual purity. And the only one who ever pays any attention to him is this outcast, this person from a different social group who actually invests a lot of time and resources in helping this man. So the query that I think that parable ra uh, raises for us is whether he acted out of a concern for welfare or out of a fidelity to a kind of higher rule to help someone when they're in distress. Because presumably the Samaritan wouldn't have sort of passed a bag of gold to the traveler if he just passed him on the street, right? No, instead it was triggered by this particular situation. Then on the right, uh, the hand here suggests Smith's example of the Chinese earthquake. Um, this is a great story from the theory of moral sentiments. Smith, you guys who are in Dean Peart's class are talking about this. So the thought experiment is that the great empire of China, with its 200 millions of inhabitants, is swallowed up in the middle of the night by an earthquake. And an 18th century European, maybe a merchant in Glasgow, hears of this news. And at first, he's shocked. He thinks, oh, how terrible. But then pretty soon, he starts to think, oh, wow, I wonder what effect this is going to have on my business. I wonder what this will do to the price of tea. And by the time evening comes, on the day when he heard of the terrible earthquake, he is so little concerned with what happened to the 200 million of his fa fellow human beings that he sleeps soundly without giving them a thought. So his coefficient of effective sympathy for the Chinese is pretty low. But, Smith says, what if you had gone to that same merchant and said, would you, um, would you be willing for your finger to be cut off in order for this earthquake not to happen? And the loss of this finger is going to be so painful for the man that it's going to cause him much more actual disutility, much more actual anguish than the loss of all the people in China. But it put that way, if the question is, would you want the earthquake to happen Instead of, instead of losing your finger, the person startles at the thought because it's a terrible violation of ethics and he would, rather, and he would probably rather lose his whole hand rather than sacrifice uh, all the people in China. So the, the final quote I want to leave you with is Smith's reflection on all this where he says, it's not the power of humanity, it's not the feeble spark of benevolence or welfare sympathy uh, that nature has put in our hearts, but it's a stronger power, the more forcible motive of reason, principle, conscience, and the impartial spectator that often motivates us to engage in ethical action. So 
I think that when we have that, those spectacles on, we see that welfare sympathy, although it's a powerful way of thinking, is perhaps not complete. And that if economics wants to deal with sympathy and it wants to escape from a self-interested agent, it ought, to inform, it ought to include all the forms of sympathy and not just the welfare kind. So uh, we have exactly 15 minutes left for questions. So thanks for your attention so far. I think this is a pretty informal group, so if you just want to raise your hand briefly and then speak out. Yes, sir. You didn't use the word empathy. And I know people who draw attention between sympathy and empathy. Does that figure at all? Is, is that something separate from the four categories of sympathy, or does it overlap with one of the four categories? That's an excellent question, and I probably should have incorporated that. Empathy corresponds largely to Concord sympathy. And apparently, I'm not a linguist, so I can't speak with complete authority here. Apparently, the German words for empathy and sympathy are completely unrelated, whereas in our language they have the same base. The German word for what I'm calling welfare sympathy means alongside with, whereas empathy means within. So that captures the sense of imaginative projection into someone else's circumstances. And the switch supposedly happened in the early 20th century thanks to influence from German aesthetic theory. I'm not sure of the details there, but that's when our meaning split off. But so for Smith and the other theorists of the 19th century, sympathy was including both meanings. But perhaps that accounts actually for why we have this divorce in the, in the modern age. Right. I, th I think that it's both proximity and repeated dealing, or habitual, habitual affection is Smith's term, that affects what I would call welfare sympathy. So our willingness to actually deploy resources just for someone else's well-being is higher for people who are close to us than it is for complete strangers. So even, even our sheer experience of being in this session room leads me to sort of, you know, I'm, a little, I'm more concerned for whether you guys are too hot or too cold than I am someone who's out in the quadrangle. Uh, but in terms of moral concern, I would no sooner want to steal from you than if from someone else at, outside. So what, what I would propose is that there's actually two different sympathetic gradients. There's one of welfare sympathy that declines fairly steeply, but the Concord sympathy gradient can in principle be flat. Um, yeah. If you're listening to the impartial spectator, it should be flat. Um, but, but I think that Smith was not totally clear in his use of terms, and he, he's confused us a little bit, and we think that both gradients have to be flat. Uh, whereas, I think for most people, unless you're kind of a utilitarian hero, it's very hard to live that way. It's really hard to give 90% of your income to um, charity, even though in some sense that's what we ought to do if we were thinking like good utilitarians. Yes? Did you want to add on to that point? Or? Yes, because I think Smith would never say it's your own sympathy that you should be paying attention to. 
it's uh, the sympathy of many different people over many years will come up with a set of rules that work. Ah. And so it's, you, Smith didn't trust the individual, but he trusted the group in a sense. So That's the group could tell the mother that they Yeah, there's certain rules yeah. that we develop over time, and these rules are written up for later. Mm -hmm. but well, I, no, do you want to? I was just going to agree. That's, that's an excellent point. And, and in fact, Bentham says uh, something similar. He says that sympathy can lead you to do actions that are either good or bad. And his example was your friend burns down a city or, and he's in jail. And so because you're sympathetic to your friend, you go break him out of jail. And it's like, well, was that the right thing to do or not? And he gives this whole succession of examples there. So, so Professor White's exactly right that if it, we just look at our own sympathy, if our own sort of immediate in the moment feelings, then we're likely to be misled. But, but the Smithian response is that we formulate over time these general rules where we say, oh, the thing that's usually uh, blamed is harming someone else, or the thing that's usually blamed is interfering with the course of justice. So even though I feel this pull to let my friend out of prison, I won't because I know that the well-informed spectator would not approve. Uh, so even though our momentary feelings can lead us astray, this repeated interaction is what he, what Smith argues eventually li leads us in the right direction. Yes. Right, right. And, and he, he's very concerned about this too. Uh, his example is um, infanticide. So the terrible practice, and he talks about how in ancient Greece this was done, of exposing children to, to death because they were unwanted. Um, or as Smith says, because of remote considerations of utility. And he's shocked because even these wonderful philosophers, even Plato and Aristotle, would justify this practice, even though it seems so repugnant. And, and the way he deals with that in his system is he says that the, sentiment, the sentiments of morality are very powerful, and they can't be totally destroyed, but they can be warped. So in the case of infanticide, it is possible for path-dependent cultural developments to lead you to be blind to this one um, to this one area where you're, where you're really transgressing, you're, you're harming a minority or you're ha harming a, a group. Uh, but he thinks that over time, the general judgment of humanity will be correct. So he says, we, we, now we look with horror on infanticide, and everyone looks with horror on Nero and his misdeeds. So if you can just get out of the narrow group you're in or even the, maybe the epoch you're in and appeal to the, the broader moral sense of humanity, then you're likely to get a more correct outcome. Well, but it's never yeah. set in concrete, right? So our yeah, moral imagination really allows us to, to change and grow mm -hmm. over time. And we have to be working at it. So, so in a way, it's a dynamic system that it doesn't guarantee good outcomes. It's just saying that in the long run, the chances that good outcomes will happen is better than not. That's a great question. Um, I, I, frankly, I just worked with two people because it's, it's tractable and easy to handle. Um, so let me think if, if the actor, so you're saying what if, what if Agent A was Procter & Gamble? Or I think in that case, there's a lot, out, there's a lot of other things going on as, in terms of the decision-making structure of an institution. Um, I think in some ways, additive sympathy becomes even weaker when you're dealing with a large group because you don't have that proximity, you don't have the knowledge of the people who are going to be affected by your actions. So if Procter & Gamble, not, I don't want to slander p and I'm just making this up. If they're trying to decide, hey, should we build a plant in India that will have unsafe um, plumbing or, or that might blow up, the, their, their ability to make a good ethical choice there is probably not going to be guided by their actual knowledge and concern for the Indian farmers in the area, it needs to be guided instead by the more powerful rules that come from Concord sympathy or from other, some, some, from some other philosophical um, source of ethics. Does it tend to be sort of naturally more or less governed by that? I mean, you know, we sort of, we talk about our natural impulse is not to take something 
I think it could be obscured because your own agency is not as clear. I mean, this, you know, when we talk about the, the Holocaust, and that's often what comes up, is that each step in the chain isn't maybe the decisive one. So you can imagine, you can pretend to yourself that you're not very culpable. So in a corporation, maybe that same dispersal of responsibility weakens our Concord sympathy, which maybe is an argument against bigness, come to think of it. Did, did, did you want to? I think Dean Peer will be able to add to this. My impression is that it's a very difficult, convoluted subject, what he actually thought. He seemed to be a kind of, I guess he was a kind of deist. At least that's what comes through in the, in the moral sentiments. I mean, he'll talk about nature with a capital N, planting things in human character that lead to our good. And so it's pretty clear that it's an idea of God, but it's not a, it's maybe not a Christian God. Um, and he, he certainly doesn't want there to be a powerful, established church. Um, I, I don't know whether his system... I think, I think it stands up even if you have a purely secular viewpoint. It's one of the reasons I love the book so much, because I feel like it has a lot to say to an age like ours where there's both a lot of secular-minded people and then religious people of a, of a wide variety of different viewpoints. I think this is a framework that you don't have to have any particular theistic commitment to appreciate. I actually would like to see if Dean Peer would like to add to that. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's the same, but he does talk about death as being both the great disturber of human happiness and the great defender of order because people fear it. Now, whether he meant fear of punishment or fear of afterlife, I'm not sure, but that's a possible connection. Um, does anyone have? Yes.
And this can be situationally determined, it can be an illness, it can be situation, or it can be chronic. Credit level can be chronic. But so those some of those factors might might influence you. Thank you. Maybe I can get some citations from you later to look into that, yeah. Because one of the problems here is that Smith is doing a combination of economics, philosophy, psychology, and God knows what else. And this is 200 years ago, so I'm sure there's, there, in a lot of domains, there's more state-of-the-art thinking about these things that it's difficult to maybe get a handle on. So thank you for, for that comment. You're saying at the That, that's so a rich the, I had this question, to what extent is this conception of sympathy cognitive right. as, as opposed to emotive or emotional? Let me preface my answer with a sort of disclaimer, which is that what, I'm not trying to convince you all that you should be Smithian moral sentiments ethical theorists, that you should actually adopt his viewpoint. Because that, th th there was a big school of thought uh, along those lines that was developed after him, but lots has happened in philosophy since then. So the point is not necessarily that you should feel this way, but that if we're going to think about sympathy, then we should at least think about the full spectrum of sympathy. But, but Terry, to get to your question, I would argue that, yes, co Concord sympathy has a lot less of the character of immediate re response and more of the character of considered judgment. Because even if you were, like as Smith says, a cold person who felt nothing for others and was just naturally not very, you just were kind of unfeeling. As long as you still wanted to have some harmony between your aims, thoughts, sentiments, and them, you would develop this idea of rules. So even if I don't really care that much for you as a person, if I fear your disapprobation, if I don't want everyone to hate me, and in particular if I, if I want to feel praiseworthy in my activities, that would still be enough for me to adopt these general rules of behavior. And then if, but if you don't feel that, and, and Darwin speaks about this a little bit in The Descent of Man, if you have no concern for the approval of others, no concern for praiseworthiness, then you're just, you're just an evil person. That's just all it is to it. The, the nature of your character is such that you don't care. And so it's sort of hard to know where to go with that ethically, uh, but at least from a perspective of how that person will actually behave, they, they won't have any regard for other people. So I think I'm basically agreeing with you, but... Um, there's probably for your attention and questions today, and I hope that um, even though we might not have come to complete sympathy in our conclusions, that we have concord sympathy with each other in the pursuit of better understanding of these matters. So thank you very much, and have a good afternoon. There's some hard copies of the paper if you're interested.